Hey everybody, it's Matt. Welcome or welcome back to the Journey Church Podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can automatically get our weekly episodes. And you might want to go ahead and subscribe to our Journey YouTube channel as well. You'll find messages, music, interviews, inspiring stories, and more for you all right there. Now, I hope this episode helps you take your next step in following Jesus. Thank you guys for coming. Let's start in with, uh, we've got a new series starting today called Losing Connection. It doesn't sound all that great, does it? Losing. Uh, nobody likes to be a loser. So let's think about something good. You ready? Think about the person you want to become. Like in your mind, think about the person that you're even trying, maybe some of you are trying to make efforts toward being that person. Like for those of you who are students in the room, maybe they're, uh, you know, maybe you're in band or you're an athlete and you are working really hard to be really good at this thing, right? Or maybe you're an artist or, or, or whatever it is, you're, you want to be, you want to be at this level and you're working to get there. Or uh, maybe some in your job, uh, you see the people around you and you like see across the nation, like, man, I want to be there. I want to be at that level in 10 years. I be and you're working toward to get better and better and better. Maybe some of you in the room uh, as parents, I know I'm 19 years in, 19 and a half years in being a parent. And um, guys, I'll be honest with you. I'm just now figuring out that I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so if you're like me and you're suddenly realizing, oh, I thought I knew what I was doing, but I don't. Like, hey, parents, we always want to be better. Or maybe just with your dating relationships or maybe in your marriage, you want to try to improve that. And you're thinking about the person you want to be for that person. Um, maybe for you, it's just an internal thing. You want to have less anxiety or you want to carry worry less or you want to, you look around and you're like, people are so joyful all the time. I want to figure out how to have more joy in my life or whatever it is. Maybe you want to be more grateful but whatever it is, think about the thing. You got it? Now let me ask you a question. Do your friendships encourage and help you move toward being that person? Do the, do the friends you have actually help you do the hard things that you want to quit doing that you know are best for you? And do you have people around you who are in your life and know you well enough to know when you're getting off track and to warn you? And do you have friends who are close enough to when you're not getting it and you're not sure what to do that you can go to and they can support and encourage you forward? So here's, here's what I'm learning. Some recent research tells us that most of the people in the room don't have that. So our Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, Surgeon General of the United States, put out in May 2023 an advisory on loneliness in America. And I got to do a little reading of that um, and looked into it. And I want to share some just disturbing statistics and research that helps us all just kind of, this is a reality. And if it's not for you, it's a reality for somebody sitting next to you. Let me just show you that um, according to him, 20% more time at home alone than 50 years ago. Adults spend 20% more time at home alone. Now I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I'm just saying it tells you where your, your values or your, or your calendar is, right? That you're spending more time at home alone than you are out doing things with people. Gen Y and Gen Z, those of you who are in your teens and 20s, right? Uh, you spend uh, 70% less time with your friends than your counterparts did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the people in their teens and 20s spent 70% more time face-to-face -face with their friends than you do. Oh, is that why mom's concerned about my social media use? Yes. Okay? So I'm not saying social media is to blame, but it does, it does have something to say about how we spend our time and who we spend it with, right? So let's just, I mean, we should be aware of that. And also, adults in the room, uh, a 2022 survey said that 39% would say they feel very connected. That means 60% of the people in this room don't feel very connected to somebody. That's a, that's a little concerning when you think about the fact that we seem to all be very connected with people in terms of who we, what we like and what we say and what comments and da, da 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 but nobody feels very connected. That's interesting. Why is this so important? Well, let me tell you what's important. It's actually having an impact on our national health and on your health, let me show you what his conclusions were and Dr. Murthy why this is so big, such a big deal. Poor social connection increases your risk of premature death by 60%. It's like you're smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So just so you know, if you're not paying attention to your friends and your friendships and your social connections, you're on a path to die early. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that, Jared. Really encouraging. I know. I know, but I, I want to show you the reality because I think, here, here's what I think is true of all of us. I think we just don't think about how important friendship is to our overall mental, physical, and emotional health. 
And we're going to talk about more about why that is. But here's the most concerning of all the things that I read. I mean, that's concerning. But of all the things that I've read, of all the implications you could have, you're all looking at me going, yeah, but COVID did it to us. Oh, but no. In 2019, there was a survey done. You ready for this one? In 2019, pre-COVID, half of Americans felt isolated, invisible, and insignificant. Let me tell you why I'm concerned about this. Because I think our communities don't thrive because we don't think of it as, as ourselves as part of a community. And we don't think of ourselves as part of a community. Let me, let me just think about this for a second. When you feel isolated, you don't go ask for help when you need it. Because isolation, by the very fact of, of, of its definition, means that you feel alone and there's nobody there to go to. And if you feel isolated and you're dealing with financial difficulties or how to do something financially, you don't have friends to go lean on and ask for help or to figure that out. And if you're having marriage issues, you don't have friends close enough who you can lean into and talk to and encourage you through this tough thing to stay together. And if you're having work issues with your boss and you're about to go say something to him because of what he said last week, you don't have a friend to go like, don't say that. I know you want to write in an email and then don't send it and keep it, but don't do that. Like our friends, isn't this true? Our friends keep us from so much chaos. Like isolation produces not because anybody wants you to have chaos in your life and you don't want chaos in your life, but think about all the chaos you create when you feel isolated. Think about when you feel invisible, the chaos you can create in your own life. You don't feel a connection you don't feel like anybody notices you or sees you. We have a need in us to be noticed and known and, and, and seen. And if you're not seen by the people who are healthy for you, you, maybe you can be seen by the people who are unhealthy for you. And you make decisions about relationships and dating all the time based on who sees you. And you end up getting into a situation where you're just trying to be seen. I'm just trying to be seen. And you are desperate for connection, which is not always the best way to build a great relationship or a healthy one. And so you create chaos out of that that puts you in a position to get hurt really badly. And then if you think you're insignificant, you miss out on the fact that God has a purpose for your life, that he put good things in front of you to steward and steward well for the good of others. And, and you miss all that. And so you don't take, you don't take a step or, or do something that looks like kind of hard because you don't trust that God has anything good for you on the side. All you can see is the bad, 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 bad. And you never move into this place where you are significant and needed and known. And God wants to help you do that. And so you miss out on thriving in life. Think about all the chaos that creates in our life. Think about the chaos you've seen in other people's lives because they didn't have great relationships around them. Think about what you've watched people do at work that you don't really know, but on the outside you're watching and you're going, man, if somebody had only told them blank, man, if I wish they would have, I wish that, right? And all of that. So it's no, it, listen, all this research, it should come as no surprise to anybody in the room then that when you think about what God did in Genesis and the creation story, he created us for something much different than what we're experiencing for most people in the room. In fact, if you go to Genesis and you start reading creation, it's kind of funny. Uh, most people talk about him creating something out of nothing. But what, when I've reflected on Genesis 1 and more, I've studied and looked at different scholars and different people who study this stuff for a living. Like all they do is sit down and study this the, in the Hebrew language. It's really about creating order from chaos. Like he creates light and he gives day and night their time. He puts a boundary on darkness and puts a boundary on light. And then it creates land and water. And land and water, instead of just being all mixed together, there's boundaries and there's clear lines and it gets organized into places where plants can come up. And he starts putting plants on the earth. And it's, it's kind of funny, you've never thought about this before, but all the plants that on earth, they produce the same kinds of plants. Like an oak tree drops an acorn and it doesn't show up as an apple tree. Like it's organized Everything is, has order to it. it, it starfish do, does not birth a, a, a blue whale. Like it, it doesn't happen that way because it's organized. Everything, all this chaos that was going on in the world, God came and just like, I'm going to shift this and put it into the right place so that chaos has some order to it. And then we get to the creation of human beings. And you probably never thought about it in this way, but God started creating order for us as human beings in the very beginning. In Genesis 1.26, it says this. And then God said... Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. 
So God created mankind in his own image. The image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now let me, let's, just, let's just walk slowly through this. Perhaps you've never noticed or maybe you've noticed it and you've wondered about it, what it means. But in Genesis 1.26, there's this let us and it's God. So listen, I cannot explain this to you. This is a mystery. But Christian people have been thinking about God as one God. He is just one. There's not multiple gods. There's one God. But he is represented to us in three different persons. We have God the Father. We have God the Son, Jesus. We have God the Spirit. I can't explain to you how that works. But here's what I know that is represented in Scripture throughout from Old Testament, New Testament, and all through it. And different scholars have different ways of looking at this and explaining it. And I'm not good enough to explain it, nor am I smart enough. Okay, so if you have questions about how this works out and how God is a trinity, what that even means, we can sit down and I can point you some really good resources, but we don't have the time to dive into it. But here's what I want to say. God says, let us, meaning God is such a, one writer I read said, in a divine dance with these three persons that they are one. And they're so closely related. They're so unified. They have a divine unity. In fact, God exists inside of his own community in which love is being shared between Father, Son, and Spirit at all times. Father serves the Son, Son serves the Spirit, Spirit serves the Father. And they exist in this total beautiful unity. So in Genesis 1.27, when he says that he created in the image of God, them, the them, we're the them, we're created in his image, meaning this, If we're going to reflect his image back to him, think of yourself like a mirror of who God is. If you're going to reflect back his character, you can't do that by yourself. Yeah. You're creating the image of God. And God is this perfect unity, and you can't get to that same place without community, together unity. So with other people, you reflect God's image better than alone. Think about this for a second. Most of your day is consumed by thinking about yourself. And I'm not saying it's necessarily bad because you are you and you're inside your own head and your voice, I mean, that's important, right? But I mean, think, think about it. You're gonna go to work tomorrow. Those of you who have a job, you're gonna go to work and you're gonna look at your people you work with and you're gonna be like, if they would just do what I told them to. Or you're gonna be working with a team of people And you're going to have said last week, hey, this week when we get in, we're going to do this, this, and this. And you're going to get there tomorrow and somebody is going to be sick and it's going to be on you to cover for them. Right? You're going to be at home, maybe even tonight. Gosh, it's Sunday night. Maybe Sunday night is family making dinner tonight. And you have plans to sit down in the kitchen. Everybody's going to be in there just making a good old time together. And doesn't that just work out great every time everybody comes to the kitchen? No. No. I'm not saying this is like perfection, but I'm just saying we think about what we need in the moment and it causes all this chaos everywhere we go and chaos just starts to expand because we think about what we are and who we are and we don't think about the community, the relationships, the effect we have on other people. And God says, I designed you (laughs) to thrive, okay? Okay? We, we reflect God and community, and that's how we know we're thriving. So, so listen, you know what the first problem was in the Bible that God had to solve was he's creating humankind? And it wasn't sin. In Genesis 2.18, here's what he said the problem was. As he's creating human beings, he said, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. You are not meant to do this life in isolation by yourself. So if you're out there thinking, well, I just don't have it figured out, that's right. Because you weren't created to do it all yourself. You were created for a group of people, a community, and relationships to help you move through life successfully. So here's how we're going to say this. Here's our bottom line for today. And I I might even make you repeat it after me. Isolation leads to chaos. Community leads to life. Let's just say it. You guys did great. That reminded me of being an English teacher and it felt really good for just about 30 seconds. Then I thought the papers I was going to have to grade and now it doesn't feel good anymore. (laughs) But here's the deal. Isolation. You have to think about this from just practical terms and the research we just read. If half of Americans 
feel isolated, invisible, and insignificant. They are not thriving in their life. We're not, we are connected, but we're losing the connection that creates the thriving life that we all need and want. Because I know you're in the room. I know you want these kind of friendships. And this is why when Jesus comes on the scene, when Jesus arrives on earth and he starts teaching and preaching and going around every way, he starts using language that is about the family of God. He uses this, this language of family. He taught his disciples to pray, our father, you should address God as our father. Say, say our father who is in heaven. Because God is like a father to you and he wants to love and give you good things. So you relate to him like a father and you call him father. And Paul even went on to say after, afterward, Paul is writing and t- telling a group of Corinthians, uh, Corinthian church. He writes and says, don't even just call him, follow him. You should cry out Abba, which is a term called daddy. It's like a really close connection. Jesus was trying to point to something that God is close to you. He's your father. And then Jesus went so far as to call those of people who were believing and trusting in him and following him. He called them his brothers and sisters. In fact, there's this really interesting moment. It seems kind of odd when you read it and you don't think about what Jesus is doing, but he's in this middle of this kind of like, uh, I guess, house and he's teaching. It says he's inside and he's pack- people are packed around and a person comes in and says, hey, your mother and brothers are outside waiting to speak with you. And it wasn't like Jesus was disowning his family, but he looks at the guy and goes, yeah, but aren't these my brothers and sisters and my mother already in here with me? He was drawing people in. And, and his whole mission and his message and everything he did was about defining who was in and out in a different way than what the Jewish people thought of and what people thought of in general. He, what, what, what about that prostitute? Yeah, I mean, she could be part of the family, God. Yeah, but, yeah, but what, about, what about this guy over here? He, he cheated on his wife. Yeah, he, he he's actually can come in the family, God. What, what, what about this guy? He's really poor. Well, yeah, he can come in too. Well, what about this guy? You, surely you don't mean this tax collector. No, no, no. He can come in too. Like, There's a place for all these people. And Jesus was all about creating this family while he's here. Just so in case nobody's ever told you, Jesus didn't just come to die on the cross just for your individual ticket to heaven. Yeah, that's part of it. But the gospel is so much bigger than that. Do you realize that Jesus' death came to solve your sin individually, but also the repercussions of your sin it has on other people? Like your sin always breaks relationships. It hurts people. And Jesus came to redeem all that. His death and his resurrection created a new way to have this relationship with people around you so that grace could define us rather than the way we behaved all the time because he knew we wouldn't, couldn't get it perfect and we weren't going to get perfect. And he says, no, 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 I came to establish a new kind of community. And listen, down through time, that community has been called the church. It's just simply a gathering of people who are trying to figure out to live in unity together despite all of their differences. And all, listen, if you're not a, if you're not a follower of Jesus here this morning and somebody dragged you in here and this is your first time back at church, thank you for coming. This could be helpful for you to think about your own friendships, but what I'm about to say does not apply to you. If you're a Christ follower, listen to me. This is a command from Jesus. This is not optional for us. If we say we're going to follow Jesus, we can't ignore the fact that he called to this kind of community and this kind of connection and this kind of family. Before Jesus leaves, he tells this to his disciples in John 15. He says this, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Which Jesus did. He laid down his life for his friends. Think about the impact of this command. I'm commanding you to love each other as I have loved you. What I'm leaving with you is this example of how you love other people and live with other people because that's the best thing I can give you because you were created in the image of God and part of the image of God you're missing is thinking you have to have it all figured out instead of depending on this community to come in around you and the people around you to encourage you, fight for you, help you, move with you, mourn with you, celebrate with you. So let me ask you the question that you've probably been thinking. You probably haven't been thinking, honestly. This is a really weird question. So are you taking intentional, consistent steps 
to connect in community. Why do you need to use the word intentional, consistent? Because here's what I know. It's hard making these kinds of friends. And I don't mean hard like it's hard to find friends. I'm saying it's hard for us to finally decide that these are the kinds of friendships we need. Because everything, listen, those of you who are students, if you're in high school or college, would you just appreciate right now that most of your life is built around some freedom to pursue these kinds of relationships? And I'm not saying it's super easy for you either. I'm just saying as you, as you cross into adulthood, there are other things and other things that go onto your calendar that prevent you from feeling like you can be free to go find these relationships and spend enough time with people to build them, right? In fact, think, think about the people you spend most of the time with. It's not, listen, these aren't bad relationships. Your work friends and your gym bros and your, I don't know what ladies do, your coffee ladies, um, <laughs> I don't know who it is. I don't, I don't know who, listen, you've got, listen, you've got lots of friends. I'm not saying those friends are bad, but, but most of those friends are built around practical, functional, and transactional friendships. It's practical because, well, we just happen to like the same things, so we just go do the same things together. Or it's functional in that, well, th- this is easy because we've always, we just see each other and we just keep doing this and that. it's kind of easy. And it's transactional because you really don't expect any more from them than what you're willing to give. So it's transactional in the sense that like, you're not going to go out of your way for that person, but you definitely want to hang out with them. And I'm not saying that's bad. Gosh, some of those people might be on the verge of being the kind of friends that you really need. But here's what I want, I want you to know about the friendships that we mostly have in America. They're efficient but they're not sufficient. Yeah, we have an efficiency model in America. Maybe it's because of the way we were built from the ground up and we had the industrial revolution and we just work, 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 work. And we, we think of our friends that as being as efficient. And, and some of you in the room, I'm, I, I'll be honest with you. If you're not being intentional or consistent with the friends who are helping you become the kind of person you want to be, then you're not becoming the person you want to be. You're just letting whatever's practical and easy and efficient drive you. And that's not how you get to be where you want to be. And that's kind of sad, right? Because we don't even recognize the power we have in our hands. Let me just say, if you're anything like me, there have been so many times in the last month where I've been like, oh my gosh, we should get together and do dinner. Gosh, we would just a couple hours to hang out and talk and eat and slow down a little bit. And have I booked that dinner? No. Why? Because I got other things. I am busy. I got this and I got this and I got this and I got this with my kids and I got that at work. And man, I just want to get home. and I just want to relax and I just want to, on my own, 20% more time alone than 50 years ago. Why? Because we forget that it takes intentionality and consistency to build the kinds of relationships that we all thrive on. So let me tell you what I mean by intentional community. Here's what I mean. Intentional community just means this, that you find people whose values are aligned, whose direction is aligned, and the people who are going to challenge you to be better. That's what I mean by intentional community. These are people who are values are aligned with you. They're moving in the directions you want to be going, and they are challenging you to become better. And for me, that has always been in the family of God. I've never found that anywhere else. My wife and I were newly married. Been married about, let's see, a day. (laughs) I started a new job the next day. I was in a new city. We had, we had moved to Lexington. She was in physical therapy school at UK, and I was teaching in Elizabethtown. The drive from Lexington to Elizabethtown takes 90 minutes. That is leaving at 5 a.m. and getting home at 5.30 p.m., and I'm grading those ridiculous English papers I talked about earlier. And so by 9 o'clock, I'm done, go to bed, see ya. It was not a good year, Okay. What made it worse was on the front end, being in a new city. Now, we had some friends. We had some friends that actually she'd made in in physical therapy school at UK and some other friends, but not these kind of friends. You know what I'm saying? They're they're good friends, but not this kind of friends. And we just had a gap. And we started trying to attend a church about a month and a half without going anywhere because we were lazy and we just wanted to lay in on Sundays. And then we lived right next to a church that, Usually got out about 2, 2 p.m. right in the middle of our nap time, and it was really loud. And, you know, that was like, hey, we just need to go to church. And so we started going to church. And we come in, looked at a couple of churches. We found what we really liked. Like, we liked the pastor. Really liked the music. We're like, oh, man, this is really different, but I, I, I like it. 
And we kind of liked the vibe that was going on Sunday. And we'd, we'd, we'd come in and we'd sit in the back row. This is my story, not yours, back row people. This is not about you, okay? Front row people, just because I said back row, that doesn't exempt you, okay? My story, we sit in the back row. We just try, we just kind of float. In about two months of that, though, we started to feel like, what are we doing here? Like, nobody would know if we missed. No, nobody would know if we showed up or not. But people around us were very friendly during the welcome time. That happened. Like right before the pastor came up, hey, take a chance, shake hands with somebody near you. Every week we'd shake hands with different people. Nobody knew us. It felt lonely. And I remember about November, December that year, I just, I looked at Sarah and I said, listen, we, we've got to figure out how to get involved here. We've got to figure out a way to make some relationships while we're here. And so I went and volunteered in middle school ministry. My wife went involved in, in, uh, volunteered in the preschool ministry and we started to get to know some people there. And then we tried out a Sunday school class, which honestly did not work out great for us. Uh, we were about 15 years younger than everybody in that Sunday school class and they all had teenagers and we were like, yeah, I'll see ya. So, uh, but we tried, we did, our, we did our best to connect with those folks and they were sweet. They'd invite us over to like a dinner party and it just, we did everything we could. And over the next few months, we kept trying different pieces. And I got in that middle school ministry and I got to know some people there. And it was really great because I was about, I was a teacher. And so in spring break, the middle school ministry guy, he's like, hey, do you want to go on spring break with this trip? We're going to take 30 middle schoolers down to this uh, orphanage that needs some work. We're going to do cleanup and paint and stuff with middle schoolers. Yeah. I was like, count me in. Sounds great. Uh, I got to know him really well. He was a great friend. And five months later, I ended up leaving Lexington, but I didn't know I was going to be leaving. And I came back to Murray. But if I hadn't taken those steps, intentional, consistent steps, I would have been alone. And it was a really pivotal time for me to realize for the first time in my adult life, church wasn't about a place or a service. It was about a group of people for me. And from then on, I just knew wherever I went, I wanted to have people around me. I want to have people around me who were going the same direction, who would help me be the kind of person I wanted to be, who would help me become generous, who would help me become more loving to the people that I didn't really like, who would help me be the person I most hoped to be. And all of that has come through the family of God for me. So I just want to remind you, isolation leads to chaos and community leads to life. So for those of you in the, in the room um, who are men, like, ladies, you can just shut her down for about 60 seconds. Guys, I need to talk to you. I know what you're thinking. I just, I just want to, to cry out to you in my best like pleading voice. Like you need friends, guys. I know you don't want to talk about your problems. That's fine. But you need people who you're consistently with and you're intentionally with who drive you to be better in all areas of your life, not just in pushing weight up off your chest or running really fast or getting better at your job. You need some guys around you who will help you be better in all ways. So don't forget about that part. And if you need a place to meet some of those guys, I, I'm going to make it really easy for you. Ready? Next Sunday afternoon, I've got a project for you. You can meet me right out here in the atrium. Me and Jonathan, we have put together, we've got 1,400 snack bags to put together for Murray and Callaway school systems to give out during April for their backpack program. And I need help. Now, if you don't show up, me and Jonathan will be fine. We're good. It'll take us three weeks, but we will get it done. <laughs> All right? But listen, if you just want to shoulder to shoulder, meet some other men here and just hang out from three to five next week, next Sunday afternoon. Now, at five o'clock, I realize the selection show is going to happen. Feel free to stick around with me. We'll watch it on the screens. But, and we can fill out our bracket together, okay? It's all about, we're not, I'm not going to trick, trick you in anything. You're not going to have to talk about your, your marriage or anything. Just pack the bags, spend some time, hang out, get to know some dudes, okay? Ladies, back on. Ready? Okay. Now, if that's not your cup of tea, everybody in the room, I'm going to give you a pass today. Pull out your phone. Pull it out. I know it's weird. Pull out your phone. Everybody get your phone out. Go to your contacts, Okay? You know that person you've been thinking about the whole time I've been talking? Find them. You got 60 seconds to send them a message to try and set up lunch or coffee or hang out with them in the next week or two. Find it. 
Make it a consistent ask. If they don't get back to you by tonight, you text them again. If they don't talk to you about tomorrow morning, you text them again. If they don't say anything by Wednesday, they're no longer your friend. I'm kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. But you see what I'm saying? Like you have to make the step. So take the step. Some of you have somebody in your head. You're right now going, man, I could really use some encouragement from blank. And we haven't really got to consider it. Do it. If you don't do it, you're not being the friend they need either. All right, last one. Some of you in the room are going, I don't have that person. I don't have somebody to contact. I get it. I, listen, I can't help you meet the right people necessarily. But I can offer you this. I can help put you in a place where there are going to be people who value what you value, who are moving the same direction, and will challenge you to be better. And every single week, our serving teams do that. I know you're like, why would I get on a serving team? Listen, our serving teams become great relationships. Serve Now is happening on March 24th during the first service. It is a no obligation. You can just show up just to see what's out there. But listen, if you would just agree to get on one of the teams and try it out and get to know some people, I promise your experience here would go up by many notches. It is great sitting here on a Sunday. It is wonderful. But it will be even better when you serve next to some people you start to get to know who miss you when you're gone, who text you when you're sick, and who check in on you. We are the family of God. My final challenge is this. In Jesus' command, if you're a Jesus follower, you ready? In Jesus' command, it, said, it didn't say for you to go and be loved by other people like I loved you. It said go and love other people as I loved you. It is an action verb. So if you feel isolated, the last thing you want to hear is for me to tell you, you need to go be a friend to somebody. But that's the exact thing that will help you. Because here's what I know. And I know you're looking at me like you're an extrovert. I get it. But listen, people who are good friends have good friends. And if you feel isolated, invisible, or insignificant, one of the most meaningful things you can do is to love someone really well this week to reach out to them and offer them your friendship and be there for them when they're hurting and to encourage them with a text message and pray for them and to start loving people the way Jesus loves you in an intentional, consistent way. And you will find no worries in finding friends. They'll be there for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for creating this way because you didn't have to. You could have made us into these self-sufficient, just all by myself, independent people, but instead you offered us the beauty of being in your image in this community and having relationships that add so much value to us. So God, help us to pursue those kinds of relationships. Help us to see the people around us who are already have the potential to be those kinds of friends and help us be intentional and consistent in connecting with them and moving forward with them. And God, I pray for anybody in the room who feels invisible, insignificant, and feels isolated that they would take the steps to find a way to connect, that we would all be better friends to the people around us, and that this community would be better because we are actively being a community of people who are trying to live out this thing called community. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you'd like more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our Journey app to access all of our recent message content. And our app is the easiest way to share this content with friends. For more information on our church or to find our app or our YouTube channel, just visit journeycalway.com. That's journeycalway.com. Thanks for listening.